right, it's currently 10 a.m. here in our Scottsdale, Arizona location, and it's time to get started. Just so everyone knows, we will be doing a full Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can submit your questions in the chat window at any time during the presentation, and we will gather them and answer as many as we can right at the end. If we do not get to all the questions, we will follow up with you individually to make sure questions do get answered. We'll also be making this presentation available to everyone who registered for the webinar. The link will be provided in a follow-up email within a few days of this presentation. And with that, I think we can begin. If you have not heard, your presenter today is Dr. Paul Herkel. Dr. Paul Herkel is a board-certified naturopathic doctor with a passion to apply innovative evidence-based nutritional, biological, and supplemental interventions to address underlying metabolic, endocrine, and immuno immunological dysfunctions. Dr. Herkel has a special interest in neurological health, chronic pain, and chronic infections. He is a strong advocate of integrative medical education, frequently writing and lecturing to both healthcare practitioners and public attendees. Dr. Herkel lectures extensively on this topic of integrative and natural approaches to concussions and brain injuries. He is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Complete Concussion Management, an international leader in research-based concussion management education and certification. He is currently the medical director for Advanced Orthomolecular Research, an innovative and leading Canadian natural health product company, and maintains a clinical practice in Toronto area at two integrative clinics. Dr. Herkel, welcome. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so um, I'm gonna get started right away. We have a lot of information to, to go over. We have a topic that I think everyone's very familiar with in terms of endocannabinoids, but uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different twist. We're going to be going over the endocannabinoid system, but we are going to um, we are going to address it from a little bit of a different perspective. We're going to go after it from a more global and holistic perspective, and we're going to look at some other options over and above cannabis, which is obviously the thing that's very vogue, obviously the legalization here in Canada has made it extremely pos uh, popular and a number of states also have uh, even before Canada has legalized. So we're going to review the endocannabinoid system and then we're going to talk about this substance called palmitol ethylene amide, PEA. We're going to talk about some of the unique features. We're going to talk about the research, the potential mechanisms of action and how it can complement the use of cannabis, how it can be used independently of cannabis and possibly, um, possibly actually complement a lot of your other anti-inflammatory protocols. So let's dive right in. So some of this may be your view, review for people. This topic is very, very dense. So I'm gonna do a, a, my best job at summarizing a lot, of what, a lot of what's in the research and really distilling it down to clinical practice. The endocannabinoid system or ECS for short can be summarized as the system that controls homeostasis in the body. It, it's a system that we haven't known much about until the last couple of decades. And it really is important in the communication of different endocrine systems, circulatory system, lymphatic system, neurological system, and immune system are probably two most important systems when it comes to the ECS. The way that I describe it to my patients is that it is kind of the behind the scenes normalizer and balancer. It, is really something that is happening all the time. And it really is important in regulating our stress response and our recovery response. So it's almost like a tuning system. And so that's really where the homeostatic, the homeostatic piece comes in. And you can see, as, we've, as you've probably heard before, the ECS is present in many different systems in the body, from our neurological system, specific nerves, neurotransmitter release, pain, inflammation, uh, allergies, and we'll talk about how historically PEA and the endocannabinoid system has looked at allergies. Uh, and, and really, almost every single biological system has some sort of interface with the ECS. So really, the therapeutic potential is, is huge, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want to I share a little bit about the receptors for the ECS. We're very familiar with CB1 and CB2 because that's where the phytocannabinoids or uh, cannabis and CBD really target. However, the ECS is much more than just CB1, CB2. 
In fact, as many of you know, there is our body's endogenous endocannabinoids. These are called ananamide or 2EA, oh, sorry, or AEA and 2AG. These particular molecules are secreted in different times and different levels to have different effects on the body. Sometimes, in, for example, in stress response, AEA goes down and 2AG goes up. And that is part of actually stimulating the HPA axis to become involved in the inflammatory process, in, involved in the stress process. That's the mechanism of action that we didn't quite know. We obviously know the HPA axis has a huge role to play with stress, but the way that the, in, the ECS has a role in regulating that is really, really new and quite exciting. There's also other enzymes that are involved in the synthesis. You can see this NAP PLD enzyme. We'll talk about that. And this fatty acid amide hydrogelase or 2AH, sorry, FAAH is the key enzyme that breaks down these endocannabinoids. And it also applies to PA, which we'll talk about. And then obviously our CB1, CB2 receptors. But this whole system is in a constant tug of war of production and the breakdown, because this is the way the body creates that harmony. So the influence is not just on, do we bind a receptor? Is it an agonist or an antagonist? It's also the way that that is being regulated by some of the enzymes that I mentioned. So I mentioned it's not just about CB1, CB2. So those are the ones that have been known for a long time, but there also are a number of receptors that are part of the endocannabinoid system that could be considered, you know, um, CB3, for example, um, which is the case of the G class or these orphan receptors. So the G protein, you can see the GPR55, the GPR1, uh, 119. This could be considered in some, uh, some papers as the CB3 receptors. Uh, they just haven't received as, not, uh, as much attention as the CB1, CB2 receptors. Then there's PPAR, the alpha and gamma. Then there's the transient receptor potential vanillinoid uh, receptors. And, and those are ion channels, also sometimes known as the capsaicin channels. So they're a lot to do with, with, with pain and the sensation of pain. And then other obviously ionic uh, like calcium and pot uh, potassium ion channels. There also are additional endocannabinoids. So that's where this substance called PEA comes in. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail in the coming slides. But there's also more than just PEA. There's OEA, um, which is oleo uh, ethylene amide, so not palmitol, but oleoethylene amide. And there's research on, on, on OEA as well. So it's not just the take home message for the first couple slides is just not about stimulating CB1, CB2. There's a very fine balance that needs to be struck. And the body is very intelligent this way. It has a system that is constantly creating harmony in the ECS. Remember, it's kind of like ECS is, is, that, is that homeostatic tuner. So it tunes the signals. It tunes the secretion of neurotransmitters in the synaptic, synaptic cleft. And it kind of creates that calming or dampening effect, which is what we describe to a lot of our patients. So a better, more encompassing definition probably would be something along the lines of the endocannabinoidiome, which is a bit of a tongue twister to say, but needless to say, you can see by this diagram here, it is, it is very, very involved. You can see that the CB1, CB2 receptors are here in the middle and they have a, a very central role to play, but there's many other things and many other receptors that are involved. You can see the above it, the G class, the G protein receptors, the PPAR receptors, and then the other agonists like the PEA, DHEA, OEA, so on and so forth. So it really is a harmonious and at times complex, uh, complex system. And so it's a better way to understand it this way. And obviously you can see with all the different targets and the research being looked at from you know, uh, phytocannabinoids, how can we leverage the complete ECS, the endocannabinoid system for better therapeutic outcomes? Not just saying, hey, let's give a phytocannabinoid. That is, in, in a lot of ways, a botanical and also pharmacological approach. But if we're going to be looking at it more from a systems biology perspective, it would be good that we are leveraging the entire system. When we're looking at leveraging the ECS in any sort of condition, there 
whenever you're looking at a particular receptor, there is an effect that is desirable and there's an effect that is not desirable. So you can see here just with CB1 stimulation, remember CB1 is primarily found in the central nervous system, there is going to have the positive effect on decreasing nausea. That's a well-known effect of, the, of cannabis. But some of the under, undesirable effects could be some of those psychoactive effects. Uh, some of the decrease in gastrointestinal motility, uh, increase in appetite, so obesity potentially has been, have been shown to be associated with increased CB1 stimulation. So again, like with some of the double-edged sword we find in the pharmacological world, just powerfully stimulating CB1, CB2, and some of these other receptors here, you're going to have some of that negative effect or the unwanted effects. So that's something to remember, and it really opens the door for using a molecule like palmitol ethylene amide to have a therapeutic effect because it is a molecule that the body is producing itself. So I'm going to describe that in the coming slides. But I just want to introduce you to this substance because, believe it or not, this, this molecule, which plays a key part, you can see the arrows coming off it here in the endocannabidiome diagram, you can see it has a huge role to play in, in influencing many receptors. But you'll notice it doesn't influence the CB2 and CB1 receptors. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's something that everyone that learns about this particular substance that the body's producing all the time, they have, a, they have an initial question about, so hold on, how does it have an effect without binding CB1 or CB2 specifically? Well, I'm going to show you that in the coming slides, but it has a lot of other effects on the rest of the endocannabinoid. So it's a key role of the ECS. And if you look at the particular structure, the chemical structure, it's actually quite similar to our body's endocannabinoids. So you can see that the 2-AG, the enanamide, these molecules are very similar to the PA in structure. And in fact, is more similar than THC and cannabidiol, cannabidiol, which is the one that is found in plant cannabinoids. So the, the binding and the ligand effect is going gonna, is gonna to definitely be there. So it's going to have a similar effect to 2-AE just from a structural perspective. So how is PEA produced? Well, what's really neat about PEA is that it is an internal key player of the endocannabinoid system. It's created at every moment of every day, and it's produced in higher levels when the body is going through any sort of stress. So you can see here, stress can mean chemical stress, it can mean inflammatory stress, it can mean structural stress, it can mean neuroinflammation, it can mean pain. So any sort of stress, you're going to have this enzyme, this Na. PE enzyme that's going to start cleaving out the, the palmitol ethylene amide and it's going to have its effect on the endocannabinoid system and primarily as you can see here PA's action really center around neuroprotection, pain relief and anti-inflammation. And then just like every other system in the body of endogenous molecules and cytokines and um, endocrine signaling molecules, there's enzymes that are constantly working at creating that tug of war, so the production and the breakdown. So you can see that fatty acid amide hydrogelase, hydrolase, sorry, that FAAH is going to be breaking it down as soon as it's produced. So that's how the body is able to regulate PEA and, and this particular component of the ECS. As, as I mentioned before, just like all the things that are causing the ECS to be stimulated, the same things are causing PA to be stimulated. So this, I mentioned a lot of the inflammatory or infectious components, but it could also mean other types of damage. It could be chemical damage, like, and it could be structural damage, UV damage. Think of all the things that our patients are constantly being exposed to all the time. And there also is a connection to our digestive function and our blood and our uh, blood brain barrier, and more specifically, the leaky leaky gut and the endothelial lining of the digestive system. We'll talk about this in a couple further slides, but that also has P as a key role to play there. So if you have to summarize the four key areas that PA has, and this is um, really highlighted in the literature, is that as I mentioned, it reduces inflammatory processes. It specifically does that through activating unique cellular receptors 
that have effects over and above reducing inflammation. It enhances the endocannabinoid system. And fourthly, it reduces mast cell activation. Now, this is something I haven't touched on before, but any of you that are familiar with kind of the newer appreciations of the inflammatory cascade, mast cells have a key role to play in reducing inflammation, especially neurological inflammation and neuropathic inflammation. They have a key role that intersect with microglia, and I'll talk about that as we go. But that has a, a big role to play, not just in, uh, in allergies, but also in neuroinflammation. So how does it actually work? So I've kind of touched on a couple of the receptors, but let's talk about them in a little bit more detail. And there's a diagram in the coming slides, which I think is gonna summarize what this slide in, in a visual way. So we'll look at that in just a moment. But as I mentioned, it has a direct effect on stimulating PPAR. PPAR is an anti-inflammatory receptor, so it decreases inflammation, where it also inhibits the capsaicin receptors or the vanillinoid family receptors. And that is a pro-inflammatory receptor. So again, that will have a net effect of decreasing inflammation. It works directly on the, the CB3 receptor or the G protein receptors. You can see 55 and 119 here. And then it inhibits uh, fatty acid amide hydrolase. And so it inhibits the breakdown, the key enzyme that breaks down other key endocannabinoids. Unfortunately, this enzyme also inhibits or promotes the breakdown of PEA itself, but as it's focused on breaking down PEA, it allows endocannabinoids to be optimized. And then there's something called the entourage effect, which is a really neat way to describe the completeness and kind of the holistic, uh, holistic mechanism of action that the ECS has. It's, uh, it's important to note that it does not stimulate CB1 or CB2 receptors. This is why PEA can be licensed as a natural health product in Canada. And it's, it's not really considered uh, a cannabinoid uh, agonist, or it's not considered in the cannabis class. So it is a natural health product rather than a medication here in Canada. The endo, the, I mentioned the entourage effect. And so this is a term that's used for not just the ECS, but other particular compounds that have an effect on increasing the whole system. And specifically we're talking about the ECS, but it enhances some of the primary effector molecules like phytocannabinoids, or in this case, the endocannabinoids. So PEA enhances, it has its effect by enhancing effector molecules like an anamide, that you can see the two, uh, the AEA here, and it keeps it in the receptor, in the cleft, wherever it's being, wherever it's being needed and used, it's allowing it to do its job better. So this is an indirect way, the entourage effect is an indirect way that PEA can influence the CB1, CB2 receptors, but it doesn't do it directly. I really like this diagram because it summarizes the, the four mechanisms of action that I highlighted, uh, and, and it doesn't, uh, doesn't touch on the, the mast cell mechanism, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But you can see here in A and B, it's going to be targeting the PPAR receptor, and it's going to be targeting the G class, uh, the G protein class receptor. And you can see here in C, PEA inhibits and, and basically takes up the FAAH, which is the enzyme that breaks down our body's own endocannabinoids, 2-AG and AEA. So it keeps them around longer, allows them to do their job. And they in turn bind CB2 and maybe even CB1. And then you're gonna have the capsation of the vanillinoid, uh, vanillinoid uh, binding of PEA. And then specifically when you bind PPAR, it's going to have an effect on the vanillinoid. So there's a number of direct and indirect mechanisms of action of PEA. So that is a little bit of the mechanisms of action. Let's talk about the way that PEA was discovered, because I find this fascinating in just generally understanding how scientists are discovering and then using things that they discover for therapeutic action. So the history of PEA has to, be go, has to go back all the way to the 30s. And so there was a, a microbiologist or microbo, micro, micro, microbiologist, sorry, uh, Dr. Coburn and, and his colleagues, and they basically looked at what are particular things 
that could have a beneficial effect on the, the poor children in New York City. And they found that they were suffering from numerous immunocompromising conditions and infections such as rheumatic fever. And so they gave a group of 30 children egg yolks and they gave them four egg yolks a day compared to those that didn't get any. And they were testing them for strep associated issues, rheumatic fever. And they found that the, the kids that got the four egg yolks, even though they tested positive as if they were exposed to the strep infection, they didn't have any of the symptoms of rheumatic disease and rheumatic fever. So this is the first evidence that we found that in hindsight, after researchers in the 1950s, specifically Dr. Kuhl and his colleagues, finally isolated PEA, looking back, they found that PEA is rich in egg yolks. And that's how they it was originally found for immune function. And then fast forward to the 1950s, it was isolated from soy, and peanut meal. And then in the 1970s, the, the next evolution was to study this in large scale, six double blind placebo controlled trials. It was actually used as a drug called Impulsin in the former Czechoslovakia. And they were studying it in adults and they studied actually in children as well. And they found that there was a positive preventative effect of using PEA as well as a treatment effect and it was targeting the common cold and influenza specifically. And, and at this particular time, there were influenza outbreaks that were happening in this part of the world. And they found that PA was effective as a, both a preventative, so they were almost using it as a vaccine type, except it doesn't have the same mechanism of action, of course, as a vaccine, but it's kind of like an internal uh, immunomodulator as well as, uh, as, as, well as interventional. And, the, the initial, you can see the food sources of PEA, there, there, there are a number of food sources, egg yolks, soy, peanuts, are all different types of sources, as well as palm, which is where AOR's PEA is sourced from. So there is ways of getting it through food, but the initial research on immune function was very, very uh, intriguing, and they were actually using it as an extract at the time. So... Fast forward now to the 70s and, and further on into the 1990s, this is really where the majority of the research on PA was done outside of immune function. So in the 70s, it was immune function. In the 1990s, a professor named Rita Levi Montalacini from Italy was really the first to publish the anti-inflammatory and the pain modulating mechanism of action of PA. And the majority of the research really came out of Italy and Spain. And there was at least 40 human clinical trials done on chronic pain to date. And there's more research coming out all the time. And, there's, and, and what was really interesting is that a lot of this research, since it was done in Italy and Spain, it really wasn't well known in North American scientific circles. And this is a, a common question that I'm asked all the time. With something that has over 350 PubMed research citations, how is this only becoming known now? Really, there's only a couple of formulations available in North America, and AOR's launched the first one here in Canada. And really, it, it's come down to the fact that it was used initially as a pharmaceutical medication, and then it was kind of shelved. And then now, a lot of the research is being done, it was done initially in, in Spanish and Italian journals in a different language that weren't really being indexed in PubMed. So now that that information is coming out, we can really start leveraging and understanding that, that research that was being done at the time. And uh, Dr. Montalacini, what, what she found is that PA levels accumulate in painful tissues. And that's how this whole idea of the connection of PA and pain started. There's an increase of PA levels in painful disorders, such as, for example, fibromyalgia and other uh, types of conditions. And then after uh, the disease goes into remission, PA levels go down. So this is the body's uh, ECS system trying to kick it up a notch to really have its endogenous anti-inflammatory effect. There's also something that's being thrown around in the literature now called endocannabinoid deficiency. Now, this is a, a relatively new term, and there's still more research that needs to be done. But basically what it is, 
is as the body is continually being put under stress, and we can think of a ton of patients that are always in this particular condition. So people like fibromyalgia, myalgia patients, chronic pain patients, and migraine patients. These are people that are constantly under perceived stress. As soon as you activate that HPA axis, you're going to have a decrease in AEA and an increase in 2AG. And eventually, if there's, there's not enough repletion of those particular endocannabinoids, the, the source, the cellular membrane, doesn't have enough building blocks to continue to produce those. So there's a, a particular need both for endogenous support, which is where PA comes in, and even with external phytocannabinoid support. So look out for endocannabinoid deficiencies being looked at in more and more scientific literature. So now let's look at the clinical applications of PA now that we understand kind of the, the, the mechanism of action and the supporting, uh, the supporting background, the history of PA. So AOR stands for Advanced Orthomolecular Research, for those of you that haven't heard of it. But orthomolecular medicine is a term that's been around for a long time. And really the term orthomolecular means the correct molecule. It's been, it was really originally referred to by the godfathers of the orthomolecular medicine movement, Linnaeus Pauling, Matthias Rath, uh, Abram Hoffer. They really focused on using molecules, vitamins, minerals that were key parts of the body's metabolism. They, they originally weren't looking at plant-based botanical compounds because those are, in their minds, were extension of the pharma pharmacological effect rather than an orthomolecular effect. So using molecules the body normally will produce or consume through diet, not through uh, a, bot a botanical extract or pharmacological extract. And so PA really fits that, that definition, which I think is really neat. And we're going to come back to this. PA is produced by the body on demand in stress. It's not something that we have to use externally. We don't have a curcumin deficiency, even though curcumin is a powerful anti-inflammatory botanical extract, where we may have a PA and endocannabinoid defic deficiency. So that's a key differentiation. And that's really important to understand when it comes to the safety and application, especially when it looks at synergy and optimizing other systems in the body. So there's, as I mentioned, there's over two, 340, 350 uh, citations, 50 human clinical trials, wide range of applications from the immune system, the neurological systems, inflammation, pain, mood. And when you look at especially the endocannabinoid system, where are most of the CB1, CB2 receptors found? Well, CB1 is in the central nervous system and CB2 is primarily in the immune system. So it's no surprise that these are the key areas that PA has an effect. I'll talk about some of the safety studies and the interactions. PA as an immune modulator. I've already kind of talked a little bit about this, so I'm going to kind of speed through this for the sake of time so we have time for questions. But as I mentioned, it was, PA was initially studied in Czechoslovakia as large-scale clinical studies. There were six of them. They were randomized placebo-controlled trials, and they really looked at flu, cough, upper respiratory tract infections. And what they found was that PA was effective at reducing symptoms and days lost to illness. And, and they, at the time, they were kind of looking at, can we do this instead of doing antivirals for, for flu? And it's important to note that they found that it was more effective for fever, kind of the malaise, almost like the impact, uh, the initial prodrome of viruses. It was more effective for that, which is primarily why people stay home from school they, or work. They, they often can plow through a runny nose, the sniffles, a cough, but specifically PA was more effective at reducing the incidence of the fever malaise, kind of that initial uh, fee, uh, viral uh, profile. And there was one study that found uh, also effectiveness in children, but as you can see in the 1977 study, it was non-significant, but it was still effective uh, in, in, uh, and to a lesser degree. So you can see here, there's a summary of the research papers. There's a number of 
uh, summaries that's been done uh, recently. I was just looking at one this morning again, reviewing it. Uh, and that was there's a number of papers that you can easily find in PubMed that review some of this. And that's that 2003 paper that you can see that source there. So you can see a, a quite a very significant decrease in those symptoms. Let's go to now chronic pain uh, as an analgesic and in anti-inflammatory. A lot of what I see in my practice, I have a chronic pain practice as well as one in traumatic brain injuries as being my focus. There's a number of key areas that chronic pain uh, that, that 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 chronic pain influences. So there's nociceptive, hypersensitivity, and neuropathic. We can break down our patients into these key areas. There are some cases that where there it's mixed, and the, there's going to be influence of multiple on uh, one of these three areas. But you can look at neuropathic as being kind of the typical radiculopathy. You're going to have that stenosis carpal tunnel, any sort of neuro, nerve impingement, nerve entrapment conditions, hypersensitivity. So these are situations where you have nerves uh, that are, th that there's neuropathy happening, but there's a hypersensitivity, uh, almost like a, a central sensitization where you're gonna have an increased nociception, an increased perception, fibromyalgia is a, a classic one, headaches, uh, you're going to have regional, chronic regional pain syndrome. These are the conditions that typically are quite chronic and difficult to treat. And then finally, nociceptive. This is uh, the body is sensing damage, this sensing chemical inflammatory damage. So you can see the tendonitis, bursitis, they tend to be acute, but they can also be autoimmune in this particular case or degenerative. So those are the three key areas that I see a lot in my practice. And it's important to understand that each key area has different interventions. You can probably surmise that neuropathic conditions, you're going to be addressing mitochondrial function and nerve pain. So lipoic acid is, is well more well studied for neuropathic conditions, as well as supporting the nerves with key nerve-specific B vitamins. So B12 synergies, a B12 uh, combination of adenosyl, hydroxyl, and methylcobalamin. So three of the active forms, the bioactive coenzyme forms of B12. In the nociceptive side, you have curcumin, boswellia. Those are your key, you know, you think of your osteoarthritis, your rheumatoid arthritis. Those are your key herbals that are going to have that effect on the COX-2, LOX-2 pathways, down-regulating those inflammatory uh, pathways and cascades. And then finally, hypersensitivity. Again, you're looking at magnesium, you're looking at curcumin. But the one thing that I wanted to point out here is that PEA has application in all three of these categories, which is really neat because not every single intervention that we have in our toolbox has application to all three categories. So that's one of the first kind of unique applications of PEA, especially as it pertains to pain and analgesia. And more specifically, you can look at this a little bit more at your own leisure, but there's conditions where PA has specific indications and has research that has been looked at to a, a, a greater or lesser degree. So we, we talked about infl inflammatory conditions, so infections, for example, like influenza, I talked about that, chronic pain conditions like IBS, uh, widespread pain fibro, and then nerve and trauma conditions and so on and so forth. So PA has multiple applications here. So let's look at some of these studies. Uh, there's been a number of meta-analyses done, but we're going to look at some of the, the, the particular studies that I think are worth. So I'm going to kind of cherry pick what I think is most clinically relevant. So this is a study on low back pain. And, and what's interesting with some of these studies, this is a 2017 study, is that it was done with an opioid. So Tavendol is an opioid. And one of the key things is that opioids, obviously there's a big crisis that's going on. And PA was done in combination with Tavantol. And they found that there was a significant decrease in the combination of PA and this particular opioid. And this was found after the third week. And this is really neat because specifically, a lot of people with chronic pain are going to be using these class of medications. So there is a huge demand for substances that can potentially augment decrease the dose of opioid like it did in the study and complement opioids to, to decrease the, the dose and, and the increase potential for dependency. So this is a really neat study in combination with a pharmacological 
intervention for chronic pain. And you're going to see this is a bit of a reoccurring theme that's going to be throughout the, the research that I'm going to be presenting is that PA, especially in Europe, is being looked at not as necessarily only a standalone, but in combination with common pharmaceutical medications. And this is quite promising, even though we'd love to have a substance that just does having a, a natural analgesic effect. But what we know about analgesics, naturally anyways, is that it, they are double-edged swords. From a pharmacological perspective, so you have all the negative drawbacks. But from a natural perspective, like PEA, chronic pain is has many different mechanisms of action. It's not just about decreasing nociceptin. We Then things like gabapentin, which upregulates GABA, which is a relaxing inhibitory neurotransmitter, would be the panacea. They're not, I can tell you that. And those of you that have been treating chronic pain know that. Not one medication does it almost completely. So looking at things that is gonna be in complement to uh, particular medications is really helpful. In this particular study, uh, looking at PA and fibromyalgia, so a different type of a different type of pain, so more kind of a nociceptive type of pain, uh, and you're going to see again a, an improvement in the vi visual analog scale of symptoms you can see of pain perception. IBS in the same category of pain, it, again in combination with a uh, with polydatin, which is a uh, which is an IBS medication, and there was an improvement in the abdominal type of pain. So not just neuropathic type of pain, but also abdominal pain. So this is kind of neat when you're looking at it. You can see again in the PE, the PA, and the PD group, you're going to have a decrease in pain perception here after 12 weeks. This is a really, uh, really neat uh, chart I put together, and it summarizes some of the studies. You can see some of the studies are from... Uh, from TMJ pain to lumbosciatic pain. I'm gonna point out here the, the Kenteri study in 2010 is a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. Uh, uh, sorry, a not placebo code, randomized controlled trial. And it showed effect on lumbosciatic pain uh, and using really 300 to 600 milligrams, which is a pretty low dose. Uh, the top studies show 1200 milligrams. In just 21 days, there was significant risk reduction. And I can say clinically, using PA for the last couple of months since this came out, I'm noticing that it probably has the best effect for this type of pain. Kind of the neuropathic pain, uh, it's going to have the most maximal effect. The, the, the neuro impingement pain, so sciatica is a great indication. Some of the other types of pain probably need to be used for longer periods of time. The, for example, the bottom one, you can see the, the pelvic pain. This did not have a significant improvement after this time. Now, there's a number of reasons why that can be the case, but uh, we, really, we really are finding the best results in the neuropathic pain. So from, an end, from a summary perspective, there's 19 human clinical trials. Five are the gold standard, randomized level line, placebo controlled. Many of them are in combination with standard pharmacological medications and they all showed a reduction in pain severity. It didn't obliterate pain or totally remove it, but it decreased pain. So this is a, a very unique mechanism of action that is not being found with other natural substances like curcumin and boswellia. They're usually studied one or the other, and there isn't that same complementarity as you're gonna find with PA, which I think is, is really, really unique. From an anti-inflammatory perspective, which is tightly tied to chronic pain, there's two mechanisms of action. So right now, the literature suggests that, as I mentioned, PEA decreases mast cell activation, which decreases the release of inflammatory signaling molecules, cytokines, chemokines, histamine, proteases. And it also stimulates PPAR alpha which prevents that real bad boy, that NF-kappa beta to be activated. And that's activated at the genetic level, which starts transposing pro-inflammatory proteins at the, at the nuclear level. So it's something that really has been considered a holy grail of a lot of, the, a lot of research. Curcumin, for example, and broccoli extract and other herbs have been studied to decrease NF-kappa beta. PEA also does that as well. More from an anti-inflammatory perspective, uh, this study looked at osteoarthritis, 
111 patients, randomized to receive a 300 or 600 PA in uh, divided doses, so breaking it up throughout the day, and again, decrease in pain that was found on standardized questionnaires. And also interestingly enough, they found a decrease in anxiety. So you can start seeing that the mood component, so it's not just gonna have a, a beneficial effect on the inflammatory condition, but it's also gonna have an effect on things that we would consider more psychological. And this is now being looked at more and more as we're realizing things like depression, anxiety, some of the key underlying processes and hallmarks are neuroinflammation. Uh, there's a couple studies on curcumin, for example, looking at the same thing and seeing beneficial effects. So PA has this effect both on inflammatory conditions, degenerative conditions, as well as kind of the, uh, the central nervous system effect as well. And you can see here some of the decreases here with the 600 milligram had the higher, more efficacious reduction, but 300 milligrams also was quite efficacious, as you can see in the pain score at the top. What about neurological conditions? So I'm going to speed through some of these for the sake of time, but you can see here, again, knowing the mechanism of action, knowing its influence on mast cells, what, what we now know is that the key influencer or effector cell inside of the central nervous system is the microglia. The microglia are cells that produce these inflammatory molecules and they are the ones that are often turned on and they are uh, responsible for the inflammatory cascade that occurs. And so if we can regulate mast cells, which are the key regulators of microglia, especially in chronic conditions, like in my world, chronic brain injuries, we are really looking at how do we downregulate chronically activated microglia, because that's what a concussion does, especially one that you're not gonna get resolution from, so like post-concussion syndrome and many other neurological conditions. So mast cells are a key target, and PA downregulates mast cells. PA and stroke, so a combination with an antioxidant, uh, luteolin, a flavonoid, find a number of fruits and vegetables. They found some significant improvement in cognition, pain, and spasticity after stroke. So this is post-stroke in 250 patients. Depression, I already mentioned the influence on mood. We talked about how mood and stress that increase the levels of PEA. And, and that's where research is now looking at, could PEA potentially be a biomarker? Uh, and again, looking at PEA, I, what I really, really like is the combination of PEA with standard antidepressants. So you can see here, 600 milligrams of PEA twice, twice a day with citalopram, which is a common uh, antidepressant, and they found that in the PEA group, there was a significant, statistically significant reduction in depression scores after just four weeks, which is actually pretty, pretty impressive. So a lot of patients that I see in my practice, they're on some sort of antidepressant already, and then you're right away thinking, hmm, are there inter interactions? Maybe I have to be careful with some of the interventions if I want to do St. John's work. So things like high dose EPA to DHA ratio omega-3s could be a good option, but we can now add in PA because a lot of patients in my population, and I'm sure what you're seeing is that they're also experiencing chronic pain, anxiety, and other neurological conditions in, in combination with their, with their mood and depression issues. And also interestingly, the study found that it, it had a more rapid onset of the citalopram, which is really neat because we know that these mood medications often take, especially the antidepressant class, it takes four to six weeks for the neurotransmitter system to acclimatize and the clinical influence to, to occur. So this is a really, really important intervention, showcasing the synergy. And you can see here, it's kind of graphically showcased here. Autism. So in neurodevelopmental disorders, this again was in combination with risperidone, which is a medication sometimes used in autistic populations, especially more in more severe cases. And they found reduction in specifically in irritability, hyperactivity, and inappropriate speech. Again, for all the reasons that we talked about, both from an HP axis perspective, from a neurological inflammation perspective, and all the other endocannabinoid systems that are being that are being activated here. So this is one of the studies looking at autism and neurodevelopmental issues. 
There's many other conditions on the neuro, the neurological front. For example, ocular conditions. I just looked at some studies looking at uh, glaucoma and other kind of ret retinopathies. Again, think about it. These are nerves that are being compressed, that are becoming damaged. The eye is an extremely nerve rich and maybe one of the most nerve rich areas with these particular rods and cones as these key receptors. So it would make a lot of sense for it to have a beneficial effect in eye conditions as well. I promised I'd talk a little bit about the effect of PA on the microbiome. And so this is really neat because this is something that as naturopathic doctors and functional medicine practitioners, we really see a lot of. It's really a key focus for a lot of our patients. And it often is the underlying issue when it comes to neurological conditions, especially when we're looking at infl inflammation in the brain. So some of the background research looked at gut permeability and its effect on C, uh, and, it's, and the effect of CBD on it. So you can see PEA has, re, has a reduced, in a very recent study here in 2019, reduced gut permeability, and they found it was almost as effective as CBD on this. It also influences uh, vitamin D deficiency because we know vitamin D deficiency, especially very low levels, has a huge role to play on the integrity of any sort of barrier in the body. It could be the blood brain barrier, it could be the intestinal barrier. And they found that PEA was key at regulating this in, the, in light of a vitamin D deficiency. And then it also shows that uh, one study here in 2019 showed that PEA restored the microbiome, the healthy microbiome. So this acromancia class of probiotics is one that really we have not done a good job at finding a stable form of it in a supplemental version, but it's a very key uh, particular species that has notable beneficial effects. And it also PEA reduces the harmful effects of uh, a class like the uh, Firmicutes, which is super important because we know that the mu uh, mucous membrane and the mucus layer and the microbiome plays a key role in actually regulating that one cell thick uh, intestinal lining. So PEA is very important at regulating both of those. So this is really, really promising. So this, this diagram shows a little bit about, you can see here, PEA is a gatekeeper along with 2-AG, which is another endocannabinoid for those tight junctions. So you can just think of how many different things make those tight junctions more permeable. Anything from gluten to glyphosate, food sensitivities, dysbiosis, and the list goes on. PEA plays a role in regulating all of those things that I just mentioned because it keeps that tight junction uh, in with high integrity, keeps it tight, and augments the, the probiotics and stimulates the growth of acromancia. And it really does that through that endocannabinoid, the G protein receptor. You can see the GPR119, which is, which is one of those orphan uh, CBD receptors. There's many other conditions that I don't have time to go over, but there's applications, as you probably can see, in a lot of different cases. So anything from BPH, prostate issues, fatty liver, burning mouth syndrome, again, that's a neuropathic issue. Dermatology, there's actually research looking at the topical application of PEA, which is kind of neat. Uh, GI conditions, just based on the last slide that I talked about, you can see GI conditions are huge. Um, I always try to look at some of the things that the pharmaceutical world is doing in terms of research that, that big money is being poured into, because typically uh, for a lot of the faults that we find in the pharma, pharmaceutical system and the way that research is done, they typically are ahead of the curve and often sometimes five to 10 years ahead of the curve because they have to look at things that they need to bring to market five, 10 years down the line and research takes a long time. And there's a number of uh, large pharmaceutical companies that are studying PEA and forms of PEA and other endocannabinoids for the influence of, for example, inflammatory gut conditions. And, and a number of others. So it's it's really neat to see the evolution of some of this research and it's not just the ones, the conditions that I've talked about. So let's talk about how do we actually get this into some of our patients. So you mentioned, uh, you saw that chart that I showed you from a dietary perspective. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of the foods on that chart really are have PEA in very small amounts. So doing it in egg yolks, you could consume four egg yolks and that's what was traditionally found by Koberg and his colleagues. 
you can consume soy or you can consume like soy lecithin is a very rich source and it might be one of the reasons that soy lecithin has been used therapeutically in the past uh, by naturopathic doctors but we know that there's a lot of allergies and there's a lot of immune reactivity that occurs with some of the foods on that list eggs soy peanuts they're often things that we find and we ask our patients to avoid because of a number of reasons a lot have to do with the inflammatory nature of some of the oils and, and other antigens that found those foods so using a supplement form like the this PEA activate or in, in Canada AOR is a PEA capsule called pro PEA in the professional series uh, the the this form allows it to be delivered into our patients when there's an increased need for it over and above what they get through their diet so the capsule version is 400 milligrams per capsule and there's 90 caps in it and there's also a lozenge which is 600 milligrams the advantage of the capsule is that it's micronized so it's going to have a, a smaller um, a, a smaller size and that basically is a fancy way of saying it is the size is smaller so it improves the bioavailability on the flip side the lozenges which are unmicronized have a higher dose and they're going to have an, a, a, an absorption throughout the whole digestive system because it's, it's a really great tasting watermelon lozenge so you're going to have both options and it's also nice to get the lozenge form for people that don't want to take pills so you can you can suck on it and you're going to have some of that uh, beneficial effect the PA source that AOR uses is from Malay sustainably farm Malaysian palm, so palmitic acid. And it's manufactured and produced in Italy, which is considered the world leader in PA research and PA production. So the quality and the source of it is really, really high, and it doesn't have some of the allergenic issues that we're going to have in some of the food sources. So in summary, as I mentioned, what's really neat and, and the big, big take home point that I really continues to, to, to be one of my big selling features on this particular product is that it really is a true orthomolecule, which as again, as I mentioned, the body normally uses it, it produces it actually. And that's actually more than we can say about a lot of the vitamins that are typically found in a lot of orthomolecular practices in a lot of protocols that are being used. So this is really neat. And the fact that the body produces it, uses it, there's a whole system that's designed to use it and produce it. It really speaks to some of the excellent safety profile that's found with PA. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So really the right molecule producing the right dose in the right place at the right time is really what AOR's mantra has always been right from its start. And PA satisfies that perfectly. So a couple of key takeaway points. I think this is really what, um, what I think you're going to find most helpful in practice. So number one, it supports the endocannabinoid system without side effects. So if you notice, it's the research studies that I presented, I didn't note any side effects because really there were none. In fact, they found that the pharmaceutical medications were often better tolerated. They had lower levels they needed to be used. So that is something that is extremely important to understand is that because it's part of the endocannabinoid system, it, it is a molecule the body's producing all the time, the body knows exactly what to do with it. So you really can't overdose on it, unless somebody may have a really rare allergy or a very sensitive digestive system for one reason or another. But it, the research is very, very rare on that. Because it's not a phytocannabinoid, this is looked at in a totally different way. In Canada, we have the whole NPN or natural health product number, and it is licensed under that it's not cannabis and so you don't have some of the negative stigma and the negative issues with cannabis that come along with it now i'm not saying cannabis is negative what i'm saying is that there are certain conditions such as teachers uh, police officers athletes that have to be careful with the use of cannabis and cbd and thc for example traveling with it uh, as simple as going across the border uh, cannabis is a uh, big issue when traveling with it and so a lot of patients are looking for alternatives to using cannabis. Some people just from a, a moral perspective, they don't like the stigma around CBD. And that's some of my patients have, I've shared that. So I find that PEA is an excellent alternative for those patients. It's safe for a lot of athletes, children and, and seniors. So really a wide range of studied age 
levels, which is also really unique. CBD has not been studied well in, in children in, in, for some indications other than things like seizures and, and epilepsy. So it really has a very wide range of applications and it can be used for multiple conditions. And that often is a huge stumbling block for people. They're thinking, how can one thing be so good for, can be so good for so many different things? And that's something that is, is really evident when you understand the endocannabinoid system, you start realizing, okay, now I see why it can be used for allergies, for the immune system, for mood, as well as chronic pain and inflammation. You start seeing that the endocannabinoid system is present in all those tissues in the body and PA has that effect. And then finally, the therapeutic dose. With CBD, I find with my patients, a patients often have to find that right mix of THC and, and, and CBD. And then they're also looking at, okay, do I go up? Do I go down? There's some titration that has to, that has to happen. Some patients, and, and um, I just had a patient earlier this week that they initially had a great response to CBD, but then they stopped having that positive response as time went on. And that's unfortunately the risk that we run with any sort of phytocannabinoid or any botanical extract is that eventually just like a drug it has a very much stronger impact on a particular receptor and a particular tissue but there's a down regulation that sometimes happens and higher and higher doses are needed and the substance becomes less efficacious so pa does not have any evidence of that because again it's an orphan molecule it's used by the body we know the dose is very defined 300 to 1200 milligrams of pa and I think in most cases, uh, most people will be good with the 600 to 800 milligram dose. With my chronic pain patients, I'll go up to 1200 milligrams. So for example, with a pro PA, the capsule, you're gonna do one capsule three times a day, but you don't need to go that high dose. You can open the capsule and put it on a teaspoon to be used for kids or use the lozenge, which is, uh, which is another really great way of, uh, a very tasty way of getting it. So there's a number of therapeutic benefits that PA has over and above the other tools that we have in our toolbox. Also, there's a key synergistic influence with other pharmaceutical medications. And this is, cannot be understated in a world that our patients are on multiple medications, especially in the world of chronic pain and neurological conditions. The synergy of PA, unlike you can find with other uh, phytocannabinoids or botanical extracts is really one of its most unique selling features. And you can see here, I'll leave you off with this diagram. The application is, is really, really broad, but don't let that throw you off. I think really, if we start using it for neurological conditions, specifically uh, neuropathic type of pain, uh, look for the neurocompressive type of pain, like you find in sciatica, in nerve impingement syndromes, carpal tunnel, uh, certain facet joints, spinal stenosis, you can use it as a standalone or a complementary treatment to medications. So there's a wide range of benefits and hopefully you've learned a little bit today about how to apply this really unique fatty acid that's part of the endocannabinoid system. Thank you very much. I appreciate you listening and we'll take some questions right now. Dr. Herkel, thank you so much for the great presentation. I just wanted to let everyone know if they have any questions, they can ask them through the chat window. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A. So our first question is the basic one. Uh, what is PEA made from? So PEA is made, so there's two, two ways to answer this question because PEA is made in the body. It's made from palmitic acid, which is a fatty acid. So you're going to find that as a component of the cellular membrane. So in short, on an endogenous level, it's produced from the cellular membrane, but externally as a supplemental, uh, as a supplement or nutrient intervention, you're going to see it being sourced primarily from, in, in AOR's case, palmitic acid found from palm. So you're going to have, um, again, it's a fatty acid. You're going to have other foods where you could source it from, but we really identified this is the cleanest, most hypoallergenic, and most environmentally responsible source of PEA. Great, thank you. Uh, the next one, so again, it's safe to use with Oxycontin? Yeah, so the research suggests that 
opioids and that um, that particular one that I looked in that study um, are going to be safe to be used with. And so Oxycontin is in that same category. Uh, I believe it's Tavantol that I that I that the study looked at. And that I I don't see any research showing any sort of negative liver metabolism issues. And there's definitely synergy that's that's being shown in literature. So I I would say I feel comfortable using it. Great. And that same person had a follow-up saying, and for migraines as well? Yeah. So a lot of the tryptan medications that you're finding migraines, you, you have the different mechanisms of action. But a lot of patients, again, hit and miss with finding beneficial effects from that, from those medications. So yes, I, I have no problem using that particular medication. Great. And looks like we got one more follow-up from that same person. Uh, also, for people that are trying to get off opioids, is this a, a good option? That's a really good good question. Um, I can't say that there's weaning research as, as we're going off withdrawal. So it doesn't have that same type of like methadone uh, type of effect, but I would definitely think out of all the tools that we have in the, in the kind of naturopathic functional medicine world, this would probably be top of my list to kind of be used, to start being used while the person's still on an opioid and then hopefully use it as, as you're layering on and decreasing the dose that this dose can be increased and, and having still some of those beneficial effects. Um, the other thing I should say also is that there is such a thing as cannabis dependency. And it's something that is now being thrown around in the literature as, again, as I mentioned, people that are using cannabis and continue needing higher doses or they can't get off cannabis and they want to get off cannabis, PA may offer those types of people an ish, uh, a potential therapeutic option similarly to the opioids. Great. And our next question is, CBD is being used for animals and pets. Has PEA been looked at for dogs, cat, horses, and parrots? Great question. And the answer is yes. So uh, AOR has a, a webinar coming up that is specifically on the application of pet pets and uh, natural interventions. And PEA is probably one of the most, uh, probably one of the most well studied. So yes, there's quite a bit of animal research, I believe specifically on dogs. And um, one of our medical advisors will be presenting that. So if you visit AOR.ca slash webinars, you will be able to find that coming up in November. Great. Um, the next question is, I just wanted to confirm there are no known drug interactions. As far as we can see in the literature, none. Okay, and next question, would you recommend PEA to be used acutely to address cold and flu symptoms? If yes, what's the dose? Great question. So based on the research that was done in Czechoslovakia, and it, it was also used acutely. And the research, again, you're looking at, um, in adults, I'd probably go 1200 milligrams. I usually go on the higher end of the dosing. So that would be one cap three times a day. You know, where or two lozenges a day and then maybe in children you'd be looking at kind of the three to six hundred milligram range getting depending on their body size and i'd still be using that acutely so you can use it both preventively and acutely great and is this safe for pregnant women great question that has not been studied as far as we can tell again i don't see a reason why it would uh, except that we just don't simply know we don't have that research so uh, it probably is out of all the different things, because as we know, in pregnancy, there's so many potential interactions and we usually steer away from botanical substances. But because this is an orthomolecule, I would, I would probably feel more comfortable using it in over a botanical substance that, you know, might be useful for immune function. So I probably put it in the same class as echinacea, which typically is considered fairly safe in pregnancy to my knowledge. And uh, this is more of an endogenous mechanism of action. So in summary, no research that I know of. However, there is, there is definitely uh, some theoretical application showing very limited potential for negative effects. Okay, and I think this is our last one. If your body normally produces PEA, why would you have to take it as a supplement? Oh, I love this question. It's one that I get all the time. So I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that the body has the endocannabinoid system that is constantly being produced as needed. So any sort of insult, stress, uh, chemical damage, inflammation, pain, the body's ECS is upregulated. 
and it's, it's a very harmonious upregulation. Some go up, some go down, enzymes are upregulated, and the system starts over again. And different types of conditions have different ratios that are being produced there, when, especially when it comes to our endogenous endocannabinoids. But there is such a thing as endocannabinoid deficiency or a supraphysiological need. So, for example, like vitamin C is a, is a good analogy sometimes I use, where we say, well, you know what, we probably need, you know, uh, under under a thousand milligrams of vitamin C from dietary sources. Some you know research shows 200 to 500 milligrams. However, we sometimes see a therapeutic effect with very limited side effects of using much higher doses of vitamin C. For example, in cases of catecholamine excess, we'll use vitamin C. Kind of helps clear some of those catecholamines out. Uh, or for example, with uh, oncology reasons. So um, the same applies to PEA. Is that a system can be supported in a super physiological way. So that's number one, that's why you'd wanna use PA. And number two, you're gonna have a potential deficiency after that system is being overused, especially in cases of stress, chronic inflammation, all the other type of more chronic conditions that I mentioned. So those are the, the reasons why you'd wanna use this particular fatty acid, even though the body's producing it all the time. Okay, and we got one more that just came in. It says, if a person does have that very rare SE, what is it? Thinking of very hypersensitive individual that gets cluster headaches. Yeah, so I think there was a couple of case reports that I, I read that looked at potential kind of GI irritation. That was the only thing that I, that I saw. So that could be a number of things. It could be like, we don't know specifically what the source of that particular PEA was. Uh, they could have had um, a sensitivity to whatever the source was. It could be palm, it can be peanut, that there's various sources. So I'm not quite sure, but I'm fairly sure it was a digestive issue and it was nothing that was really, really serious. Um, but I, I, you know, that being said, I've, I've had, uh, I believe one or two if I'm thinking, uh, you know, the, over the last couple of months that I've been using it that are just saying, you know what, it just kind of made my head feel a little heavy. And so those, that's another potential, um, that's another potential uh, quote unquote side effect. And so obviously our clinical judgment has to be used at that time. So those are the two that I've read about slash experienced. And then kind of once the PA was, was ceased, it, um, the side effects you know, were discontinued. And that I think goes to show also, you know, PA is influencing the endocannabinoid system. It's, some, it's a system we don't know a heck of a lot about. And it's something that we're just really scratching the surface of. So everything so far shows that it's very, very safe, especially because it's produced by the body, unlike phytocannabinoids. Um, but those are the potential things I'd be looking out for. But the literature is very, very clear that it's quite safe. Fantastic. Dr. Herkel, thank you so much for taking the time to answer so many questions. It has been a pleasure talking to you about the power of PEA. As mentioned before, we will follow up with everyone and include an email of a recording of this webinar. But that's it, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Appreciate being here, Harold.